The Lord be with you. <clears throat> Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, before whom all in heaven and earth shall bow, grant courage that your children may confess your saving name in the face of any opposition from a world hostile to the gospel. Help them to remember your faithful people who sacrificed much and even faced death rather than dishonor you when called upon to deny the faith. By your Spirit, strengthen them to be faithful and to confess you boldly, knowing that you will confess your own before the Father in heaven, with whom you and the Holy Spirit live and reign, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> so we've, um, we've been meandering our way through Exodus chapter 20. And the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments. And on Tuesday, Pastor Peppercorn um, laid out a few answers to the question, why the commandments? Why do we have them? Why have they been given to us? And the wrong answers that he gave us are <clears throat> that if we knew it was right and wrong, we would just do it. You know, if we knew how to behave, we just naturally behave properly, or that we would know how to get to heaven, you know, a nice little road map. Do this, then that will happen, uh, to motivate us to do the right thing. You know, if you're good, then this is your, your reward. And then finally, so that we can find true happiness in obedience. Can you be, does it make you happy to obey? Sometimes, maybe. If obedience means you know, mowing the yard in the heat of summer or taking out the trash in the depths of winter, is that the happiest, most wonderful thing that you can do? I don't know. So each of these answers, again, then gives us a, it almost makes us, want to measure, right? There's, you want to rule, you want to see how, how well you kind of do. And so if you're trying to measure and reach a goal, that if I do this, and if I do enough of this, then I will get that, what inevitably happens to you <clears throat> is you come up short and you can't ride... Uh, the teacups at Disneyland, you're just not there. So you're always going to wind up being disappointed. You're always going to wind up falling short. You're always going to wind up less than when you try to set up the commandments as a goal, as a, as a, as a template for living the perfect Christian life. So let, let's review it real quick again. Um, Jesus answers the lawyer. The lawyer again tests him, teacher, which is, which is the greatest commandment of the law? And, and to going back to yesterday for just a second, uh, the 613 extra laws, it's 603. Uh, the commandments are, are assumed in there. You have the 10. And then the 603 are, are placed around that total of 613. So what's the greatest commandment in the law? Out of all of the, all of the laws, all the commandments, which is the greatest one? Love the Lord your God, again, with every fiber of your being, with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. And then second, like it, love your neighbor as yourself. On this hang, again, all the law of the prophets. <clears throat> so yesterday we talked about how we love God with heart and soul and mind. How we live that, that who remembers the Latin, what was it? Coram Deo, right? Yeah, life before God. So today we're talking about the, the minibus, right? Yeah. Coram hominibus, life before neighbor. 
the horizontal relationship. How do, we, how do you love the people that are in front of you and behind you and around you, the ones that bumped into you and, and spilled your coffee this morning as you were trying to leave the cafeteria? All, you know, those, how do you love those people? And the way that you do that is, is first we look backwards again to loving God. Anybody been to Yosemite National Park? You've been, to, you've been to Yosemite Falls? It's a long way up there, isn't it? This is just the upper, upper Yosemite Falls, 1,430 feet down as the water falls. Now, when, when you see yourself, and, and Jesus says the great commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, <clears throat> Some, some of our Christian brothers and sisters say, well, what, what that means is you just have to, you got to give it all back to God. You know, you have to spend all this time praising God and, and giving it all back to Him. And so the question I, I ask in, in answer to that sometimes is, put yourself at the bottom of Yosemite Falls over here with a bucket. Catch that water in the bucket and throw it back up on top. It's only 1,430 feet. You know, God's kind of higher than that, right? Up in the heavens. Um, how, how well would you do? Or let's go a little bit farther east. Let's go to Niagara Falls. And put yourself down there towards the bottom with a bucket. And how much of that water are you going to heave back up? We can't do it, right? This goes back to the ruler. That the Lord God, in His gifts that He gives to you, they are so overwhelmingly, stupendously magnified that there's no way that we can ever return to the Lord the bounty that He gives to us. So then, as we love the Lord our God with heart, mind, and strength, what we do is, is that we love our neighbors as ourselves. So we shift now from the vertical relationship, coram deo, to the horizontal, to, to the coram hominibus, loving um, our neighbors and those around us. And the first place that that comes up in the commandments is the fourth, honor your father and your mother. What does this mean? Fear and love God so we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities. Ooh. But, and there again, the but. What are the good things that we can do? Mom, she loves you so much. Every morning she gets up, makes pancakes, it looks like, pours you milk. Where's her apron? Has her hair all done? Sends you out the door to school with a smile on her face, right? Or is it, there's Pop-Tarts in the, in the pantry. Get out, you're going to be late for the bus. I don't want to have to take you to school again. Hurry up, out the door. Either way, your mom still loves you. Dad still loves you too. Love and honor. Do not despise or anger them. Um, I had, I had a, a sort of a, a moment of, of synchronicity and serendipity. Is that one of the right words? Um, when, when, uh, in Minnesota, when Pastor Borghardt said um, when he has to deal with his sons, about cleaning out the garage. You gonna clean out the garage? Yeah, I'll get to it. Is the garage clean? I'm doing it. You done yet? I'm getting there. When is the garage gonna be clean? Uh, I'm just about done. I said, that happens in my house. Do not despise or anger our parents. Um, God gives you your parents for, for, for many reasons. 
They are there to, to train you up in the way you should go. They're there to teach you what, what life is about. They're there to help you understand what it means to love and serve your neighbor. And sometimes the first place that you love and serve your neighbor is by emptying the dishwasher, taking out the trash, picking up your shoes out of the middle of the living room, um, making sure that the dog is fed or walked, those sorts of things. Uh, it's the very beginning of that. So love and honor your, our parents. Serve and obey them. Love and cherish them. Honor them. And it's, it's, sometimes it's really easy to do that, isn't it? And sometimes it might be a little difficult. Don't despise. Don't anger your parents. And other authorities... Hmm. Anybody ever been there? Principal's office? Oh, there's a few honest folks among us here. <laughs> now there's more hands going up. Uh-oh. Now, I'm not saying you were there for a bad reason. Maybe you went in to get an award. The principal's award. Uh, but yet, you know, the, so it, who are the other authorities in your life? They're, they're, um, the, the Latin phrase that you may have heard before uh, is uh, in loco parentis, uh, which doesn't mean your parents are crazy. It means in the place of the parent. So while you are at school, the teachers, the principal, the staff, they function in loco parentis, in the place of the parent. And when you're here, your chaperones and the, the, the higher thing staff operate, in a sense, in loco parentis. So, you know, when a CCV says, no, it probably is not a good idea to jump over the balcony, it's not because the CCV is trying to ruin your fun. Rather, you know, it's probably not a good idea to jump over the balcony because, you know, it's like, this is what my mom would say, right, good. We're training them up in the way that they should, they should go, too. So those who are, when you're away from mom and dad, these folks are the ones who also serve in that same role. They're the same ones that help you learn how to navigate throughout life. Um, yeah. So when, when you get home from school and something, yeah, let's say maybe you... Uh, did something at school that you shouldn't have done, and you have to hurry home uh, before the message gets there so you can um, somehow mitigate the damage or change the story so that it helps you out in some way before uh, you hear that, that dreaded phrase, wait till your father gets home, dum, 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 right? Um, God puts these people in our lives for our good. And, oh, and I, I went back and forth on this next one. Who was supposed to go up here? Because in, it's such an interesting place in which we live these days, it seems. Um, but even our, our national, our state, legislators and judiciary. You could have put a policeman up here. You could have put a service member here. You could have put judges up there or anything. Anybody in the civil realm, our civil authorities, they're, they're placed there for us as well to, to watch over and guide us and keep us. And so you know, in, in our house, at your home, Mom, dad, watch over you, take care of you, um, you know, set, the, uh, doot, 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 set the alarm code at night, these kind of things. And then you know, in, in the world around you, closer, your, your school um, staff and that, they do that. And then on the national level, it's our, it is, it is our, our nationally and state elected officials who also serve, placed there by God to lead us, to guide us, to protect us, 
to watch over us. And whether we like them or not, they are there as God's gifts, God's hands, God's instruments. So again, if you see the commandments again as gift, it's the gift of authority. Because you take all that authority away, what's going to happen? You know, madness, insanity. It's going to be just absolute craziness everywhere we go. Commandment number five, you shall not murder. What does this mean? Don't hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support in every physical need. Now, what you're going to see as we get a little bit farther in here is that this second table, they're going to start overlapping. They're going to start interweaving. They're going to start getting stuck to each other um, because they are really interrelated. And this goes back again to yesterday when we talked about the wreath. Remember the, the wreath, the frame of the hoop of the wreath that holds it all together. Commandment number one, no other gods. And when you look at you know, the fourth commandment, with you know, when, when mom and dad set your curfew, and you know they're wrong because it should be you know, midnight instead of 10, or 2 a.m. instead of midnight, or whatever, what are you doing? In that moment, you're saying, I know better than the one that God has given me, right? And to say, I know better than the one that God has given me is to say, who is now my God? I have become my God because I'm the smart one. You know, who's, who here is 16 or a little bit older? Okay, move out of the house now while you know everything. Right? Isn't that sort of the stereotype? Turn 16, all of a sudden you know it all. It's like, okay, fine. Go out there and do it then. Uh, So again, so commandment five here, this starts to bleed into commandment number four. Fear and love God, we don't hurt or harm our neighbor in his body. Now, you know, there's of course, there's always the physical side of that, Right? Obviously, this means causing someone to stop living. That's straight up explanation, right? To cause someone to die. But that does expand beyond that a little bit. Um, And the classic catechism understanding we talk about when we have those who want to end life before um, a child even takes a breath, when we talk about you know, abortion, this is, this is kind of an easy one for us, right? It's causing a life to stop. On the other end of the spectrum, death with dignity, euthanasia, mercy killing, whatever you want to call it. Again, causing someone to die even though life has been given by God, and it is His to give, it is His to take back, it is His to bestow, it is, it is His to, to enhance and strengthen and, and, or, or, or abate, it's all up to Him. Yet we come in and say, I know better than God. So we go back again and move God down that list of importance. The obvious one, though, of course, is I, you know, I'm going to take the life of someone, right? Is that, so you sort of, you can get into a discussion here about what does it mean? In the the old days, we used to translate this, you know, thou shalt not kill, right? And then there was this big discussion in, in the time of the Reformation. Luther wrote a long treatise on can, can, uh, cr- can soldiers now be saved? Can you be a Christian and serve in the army? Because what's the number one job of someone who is in the armed forces? To kill, right? Your job is to make sure the other army doesn't survive the battle. 
And if your job is to kill, and the commandment says you shall not kill, then you obviously cannot be saved because your job is to do the one thing that the Bible says not to do. So, have we now just taken this entire group of people and cast them into outer darkness? Well, that, again, this bleeds back into number four, into authority. When you as a soldier serve as an arm of the government, you are an instrument, a tool of the government. You, this is weird, you aren't the one doing the killing, are you? When you have your uniform on, it is the uniform that is, that is causing the other one to no longer live. Is that about as politically correct and sanitized as you can make it? It's, you know, you're, you, you may be the one pulling the trigger, but you're not the one that is, that is killing. So, you know, the soldier who is, who is in battle, who is, is fighting on a war, that is perfectly fine. Now, that same soldier comes home and he takes off his uniform and he's, you know, he's sitting, in the front, he's sitting on, his, on his porch out front and the neighbor's dog comes in and uh, fertilizes his lawn um, against all of his wishes and against the little sign there that says, you know, please keep your dog's fertilizer to yourself. Um, and he is not very pleased with that. And so he says, you know, in the name of, you know, the U.S. Army, bang, 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 um, no more fertilizing my yard. That was a little extreme for one. Um, but now he's operating outside of. So now he's moved from killing in the name of the one who's, who has placed him there to do that into saying, no, I'm the one who knows what's best now, so the, you know, this, this has to happen. This person has to die because his dog is you know, on my lawn. You understand the difference there? Here you're doing it as an arm of the authority that has been given by God. Here you are taking an authority that God has given and saying it's mine. Pope, well, you know, Pope Francis is, let's say he's, he's a little creative when it comes to understanding the Word of God. Right. Protection as well. Uh, soldiers, police officers. They, so they do not only, they do not only go to kill, but they also prevent killing as well, right? That's, that's what your point is there too, is that their, their job is to restrain evil and danger. Ooh, which, which one of the uses of the law is that? One of the three from the first day, if y'all remember that long ago when you used to have sleep. Curb, right, yeah, the curb, to restrain the evil they, as the curb. So when you see a stop sign at an intersection, you know, again, it's to curb, that's to curb evil. So, did you ever think about that? A stop sign is a fourth commandment thing? Red light, it's the fourth commandment. Those who are placed in authority over us. So the California rolling stop not exactly obeying the fourth commandment, right? So, <clears throat> it's always easy to talk about causing someone to die, rendering someone no longer alive. But then we have the but. Help and support in every physical need. Um, so you, you may be able to do something for someone else that doesn't necessarily stop. You know, so you know, you're out by the river and a child falls in the river above you and is floating by and you, you are able to reach in, grab the, the, the kid and pull him out of the river and save his life. And that's helping and supporting in every physical need. But there's also... 
we can expand that into saying when Jesus says on the, that on the last day when the sheep and goats are separated, when I was hungry, you, I was naked, you, I was thirsty, gave me something to drink. So it isn't necessarily just not causing death or causing death, but anything that supports body and life. You know, so it, ex it expands and spreads farther out in there. <clears throat> so it, it isn't just simply, you know, um, you, you were able to make it through the day without throttling your sibling. Because I know it happens. It happens in my house too, so. Um, I just want to, right? So good, you made it through the day without, you know, killing your brother or your sister. Um, but there's also the, the whole thing of, you know, while I'm picking up my shoes, well, I have to walk past my brother or sister's room anyway, so, you know, I, I know they smell, but I'll drop these off in front of his door. Um, that's helping, right? And again, that bleeds back into commandment number four, right? Because now mom doesn't have to yell at somebody else. Or dad doesn't have to trip over them. <clears throat> oh, let's have some. Here we go. You shall not commit adultery. What does that mean? Boys are blue, girls are pink, no purple. Is it? <laughs> um, what is it? What is it? The Beyonce? If you, if you like it, you just need to put a ring on it. I'm not gonna. I won't. I won't sing it. Obviously, <laughs> but not today. Fear and love God, again, lead a sexually pure and decent life in what we say and do. And husband and wife love and honor each other. There's no but in this one, strangely enough. But it's understood, though, with the, the and. Husband and wife love and honor each other, and they then set the example. See, here's one way that you can look at this is Let's look at the church, right? Because Christ is the bridegroom. The church is the bride, right? And the ultimate goal on the last day is that as we enter into eternal life, into the wedding feast of the Lamb, Christ as the groom, the church as the bride, take up their residence together and we live forever with Him. And that's reflected in our life, in this life, in one sense with pastor and congregation, right? You know, the pastor is there in the stead and by the command of Christ. The congregation is there as the bride of Christ, and they reflect that relationship. And then in the home, the husband reflects that relationship as well. Ephesians 5, what is the husband supposed to do? Absolutely everything up to and including what Christ is willing to do for his church, for his bride. So husband and wife love and honor each other in the same way that pastor and congregation love and honor each other in the same way that Christ and the church love and honor each other. You know, it's just different pictures of the same relationship. So when husband and wife behave in a way that is outside of what God has given us to do, things can get a little problematic. You know, and there's 8,372 different ways you could decorate this meme, right? But um, anything outside of this relationship of husband, wife, fully and totally, completely committed to each other, that's where you get problems because then it starts to change the picture of who God is for his people, who Christ is. For his children. Um, and the one that's always, always fun, 
I almost reused Pastor Peppercorns from the other day, but there was some nudity in it. It's art. Deal with it. Have y'all seen the organ pipes up towards the top? There's. Was I not supposed to point that out? It's it's art. It is it okay when it's art? Okay. Yeah. So let's let's take just you know let's take a really quick trip back to the story of David and Bathsheba. David is who's David? The king of. King of Israel, you know, he's king of the world, he's the number one guy, he's, and Bathsheba is a wife, right? She's married to Uriah. David does what in the afternoons? You know, he patrols the top of the palace, he walks around the roof, because, you know, it's, it's hot in the summer in Israel, so you go outside, and he's walking around, you know, on the parapets around the roof of the, of the palace. So do you think he's walking around up there with his binoculars? Looking for what he can see? Well, binoculars hadn't been invented yet, so probably not. So, now, everybody knows who lives in the neighborhood, right? Bathsheba knows that David lives in the palace, right? She knows which building is the palace. She knows when David's out walking on the roof, right? Do you think it was on accident that she might have been taking a bath in full view of the palace roof line? We don't know, but wouldn't, wouldn't you think that maybe somebody would be keeping an eye out? Oh, look, there's the king, quick. I always have to tell my, uh, my confirmants that you know, she's Bathsheba, bath she's not shower Sheba. There were no. There's your dad joke for the day. Um, isn't it? Pain? Isn't that bad? Um, and so, so David is the king. Bathsheba is a resident nearby. When David wants to, um, how shall we say, get to know her better, does he pull out his? phone and text her and say, hey, I saw you there. Would you like to come over and play, you know, Twister? Thank you, Pastor Onkin. Um, No, what does he do? Does he put on a disguise and say, uh, UPS guy? No. (laughs) He has to send someone to her house. And bring her over. So, that, you know, we look at David and Bathsheba as it's just this, you know, these two people kind of having this little illicit relationship on the side. The entire palace staff is in on this. So it's not like it's a secret. Everybody knows what's going on. They're just polite about it. To kind of use that royal family image again, too. It's that you know, the same thing would, would happen today. The, you wouldn't have somebody sneak into the palace to have a, have a little uh, dalliance with one of the royal members of the royal family. There's protocols. You know, they, they don't just wander around. So when, when people act outside of their vocation as husband and wife, And when people don't respect the relationship of husband and wife when they're outside of that, it isn't just those individuals that are damaged, that are injured, that are harmed. And there are so many people around that. And maybe you've experienced that in some way in your life, or you know people to whom this has happened. Um, So... Maybe the best way to go back to that again is husband, wife, Christ, church. How does Christ deal with his church and his people? How then should husband and wife deal with, with one another in, that, in a very loving and, and sacrificial way? Um, and then, if you like it, put a ring on it. I left mine behind. Oops. Pretend. Um, love and honor 
one another within the bounds. Again, as God has gifted. God gives us the gift of marriage. He gives us the gift of these relationships so that we may, <clears throat> that we may show the love of God. We love our neighbors by loving our spouses. Because a loving relationship between husband and wife is then an example to those, to those around us. Seven, you shall not steal. What does this mean? Swiper, no swiping, right? Is that still a thing? It is? Okay, good. My kids used to like that many, many years ago, back in the early days of television. So, um, Don't take our neighbor's money or possessions or get them in any dishonest way, but help him improve and protect. Um, who works at a fast food place? Anybody? Do you ever get free food? You know, I, I think most places, like you, if you have a long shift, you get like a meal or something like that. Ever take home extra, extra burgers, extra sandwiches? Uh, you work at a gas station, take home an extra quart of oil every now and again. Maybe a box of paper clips from the office. Um, well, yeah, who's going to miss a box of paper clips, right? Work at the bank, all those $100 bills going by. Who's going to miss one or ten? Um, it's sometimes really, or your teacher has a pencil box. How many, you know, you get one, maybe you get two or three instead. Um, All of those things seem so mundane and simple, right? Just a pencil. It's just some paper clips. It's just a Coke. But then again, when our Lord God says, be perfect as I am perfect, and one paper clip sends you to hell, whoa, Right? You're not keeping the law perfectly, right? If you're taking what is not given you, that is against what, what God intends. Or, so it's not just the taking. It's not you know, breaking and entering, um, you know, grand theft auto or something like that. Getting in a dishonest way. You know, and we could spend hours going through all of the different ways that, that this can happen. Um, I've known people, you know, people who have had investments that have been disappeared, retirement funds that have gone away because the fund manager was going to do this to them and you know, do something extra, and then everything fell apart, and it's like, oops, sorry, you don't have any money left. Um, borrowed anybody's iPod? Looks just like mine, right? So... Protect his help him improve and protect his possessions and income. Is this one pretty easy? You think, or is it hard to avoid stealing? No. Protect his possessions and income. These are the things to do. Don't take. Number eight, you shall, ooh, this one's a fun one. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? Your turn. Uh, neighbor. So the, remember yesterday the chart of the commandment numbering, which was missing. You know, eight was missing, right? Um, in in some ways, there. 
in some ways, gossip becomes almost a sacrament for some Christians, doesn't it? It's something that is so sacred to us. Um, any Southerners here? Oh, bless his heart. You know exactly what that means, don't you? That means the very next sentence is going to be something terribly slanderous and evil about someone that you know. But it's all in Jesus' love. I want to tell you about this person so that we may pray for him. There's your one sentence of Joel Osteen for the day. Um, don't tell lies about our neighbor. Betray, slander, hurt his reputation, defend him, speak well of him. Ex now, this is the hardest part. Explain everything in the kindest way, and boy, do we ever go off the rails on that. Don't tell lies about our neighbor. Betray or slander. And it's so easy to do, isn't it? It's almost, act, we just sort of fall into it by accident sometimes, right? Did you hear what happened in math class this afternoon? Please tell me more. No, I didn't know what happened in math class. Uh, what might be the way to, to answer that? I don't care what happened in math class unless it means that the final was canceled. <laughs> right? Yeah, math? What's that? That's the pastor answer. I was told there was no math in the pastoral office, so hey. Um, you find out you, f you do hear something. And, and what's the hardest thing to do? Hey, did you hear about Jimmy? I don't want to hear about Jimmy. Well, I'm going to tell you anyway. Uh, and the hardest thing to do, the first hardest thing to do is say, don't tell me. I don't want to know. And the next hardest thing, which might be actually harder, is when you find out, is to go to Jimmy and say, I heard something. And I just want to make sure you're okay. And is there any way I can help? Because maybe Jimmy was sleeping in his car in the band parking lot early that morning. And maybe it was really, you know, maybe Jimmy just left really early and got to school really early and just wanted a nap before first period. But if somebody sees Jimmy sleeping in his car in the band lot before, you know, early before school, what's going to happen? Oh, uh, Jimmy must have got run out of his house. I bet Jimmy got kicked out. I bet Jimmy's been smoking dope and he got... You know how it is, right? He might have, you know, robbed a bank and murdered six people or something and he's on the run from the law. We can all dream, right? Um, live a Hollywood movie. So how, how do you, so to go to Jimmy and say, there's, a, there's something going around about you, and I, I'm not sure that it's right, and I want to help you as I'm able to, but I don't know how to do that without asking you what the real story is. That can be really hard to do. Especially if Jimmy isn't in your immediate peer group, right? Because let's say Jimmy is one of those people that might be different enough from you that you don't spend a lot of time with him. But how do we love our neighbor? How can we love our neighbor? Um, and then the, on the other side, it's, it's saying, just stop. Don't tell me about Jimmy anymore. I don't want to deal with this stuff. I don't want to participate 
in these things. Because you know, the last three times you came and told me something, it was completely untrue. So just stop it. That's hard to do too, isn't it? Especially, you know, if, you, if, if that person is, you know, seeking some sort of attention and validation. And, and maybe that person is in your peer group and you don't want to be alienated. How can you help that person see, don't, we got, this has, we got to stop, this is crazy. Number nine, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. What does this mean? This one's kind of weird. And number 10 as well, because you know, again, we go back to, back to the original numbering of the 10 words, 9 and 10, the two covet commandments were one, right? And so now they're broken in half, and you kind of got half here and half there. How do, how do we deal with this coveting thing? Because, let's see, this is what, this is the... <laughs> This is the end of July, and leaks are starting to happen. And what's going to happen in about six weeks, there's going to be all kinds of people lined up because they're going to want the iPhone 10 2 version whatever plus double plus awesome good whatever. I want that. I must have that. Give it to me. I'm going to do everything I can to get a hold of that object. And so what, what coveting does then again, as we jump all the way back to commandment number one, is what? It takes our eyes off of what has the Lord our God given to what is the thing that I have to go grab? Um, you know, that which we may not be given. Uh, I had a, a member of one of my former congregations said once, I look at it like this, you know, I really like your object. I'd like to have one like it someday. Not, I like your object, I must have it. See the difference? It's a subtle difference there. It's like, oh, I really like your necklace. Where did you get it? Maybe I can get one. I like your necklace, I must have it. Give it to me, it must be mine, I must... I must take it now. You know, I want it now. But that, that's kind of how we operate, isn't it? Our society has gotten to this point where, you know, instant gratification, what, you, you drive up to, well, I, I don't know. I don't know what customer service is like at fast food places these days, but it used to be, you know, you walk in the door and out the door and, you know, a minute and a half with a you know, old bag of food. It's like everything is so quick. You know, instant, what do you need? You need, I want to download a song. What does it do? You know, you... you Go to it, bam, touch the button, and it's there. Um, it's, there's, we don't really have this, this idea of receiving anymore. Fear and love God, we don't scheme to get our neighbor's inheritance or house. Get in a way that only appears right. Help and be of service to him in keeping it. You know, lo love your neighbor, help him with what is his. And we're going we're gonna to look at this, because you know, nine, 9 and 10 sort of blend into 7 here, right? Because if you're talking about stealing and taking something from someone, it sounds a whole lot like coveting. If you covet something, it makes it easier to take, right? You can justify it in some way. Well, he's got three, so I can certainly have at least one of his, because he won't... I mean, he's only got two hands, so how does he need three of those? So I'm, what I'm doing is I'm actually helping him because he doesn't have to pick which one of the three to, to leave behind. Because So as I'm really doing him a public service. You should not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does this mean?
And Pastor Peppercorn found this, this fun little image, and I couldn't figure out where else to put it. So I, didn't, I just put it over here. Um, but it seems to sum things up nicely. You know, when you're, you're after all of this stuff, and what is it going to get you? You know, you're, you're so focused on these things and ideas and whatever that it, you're just going to run yourself into the grave without even realizing it. God has given us gifts. He's given our neighbor gifts. We love and honor you know, our spouses and our families, and so we should love and honor our neighbors as well. And all the things that are theirs, we should encourage them to, because you, know, you don't like it when they come and try and take it from you, so why should we, why should you then go and want to take and grab and remove from them. So to, to, to take all of these together and sort of wrap them up into a big ball, mix them up and, and see what happens. Here's the question. Is there one, one action, one activity, one event, one thing that you can do? How many commandments can you break at one time I'm not trying to give them activities to try. This is kind of like, this is the lab. We're working. We're working in the lab here, you know? We're, we're, this is what, when you do this and it blows up in the lab, don't go do it in the garage. Right? So we're, this isn't a how to, this is a don't try this at home. Should I put a. Disclaimer up there, don't try the... So when I ask the catechumens this, it always starts with one of two things. Either you're murdering somebody, or no, it's usually you're murdering somebody on a Sunday. Because <laughs> that's the easiest way, that's the easiest way to work in number three. I'm murdering somebody on a Sunday. Instead of, instead of sitting in... All right, let's see. You're, you're murdering your neighbor's parents on a Sunday? <laughs> uh, you're mur murdering your neighbor and your parents on a Sunday. All right, in the back. Go ahead. Nice and loud. Well, yeah, now you're cheating. Because, yeah, not keeping the first does that. Um, it, three is always the hardest one to kind of work in if you do it that's not on a Sunday. Um, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Hold on, Ryan. I know what your answer is going to be because we've had this discussion. So you hold on to the right answer. All right. You, go ahead. There's some very, very, very dark people in here. This is where we hold up the mirror. Use number two. Oh, we're almost out of time, so we're gonna have to wrap it. We'll go it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you an example um, because we're we're almost. It, we maybe could go a couple minutes over, right? Because it's only lunch. They're not, they're, they're not going to eat much anyway, right? Oh, yeah, I'm the VP. Sure, why not? All right. Go ahead. Right, okay. Yeah, not remembering the Sabbath will do that. Jack. All right, I'm, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this a little less bloody. <laughs> Go ahead. L lying, and, and that's part of it. That is part of it. What do you got, Ryan? Got to be quick.
Here you go. Lying into your parents about stealing something from school. And, and, you know, and there is that. It's like, I swear to God that I didn't, you know, take Janet's brush or whatever. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to see if we can get this less, less bloody here, but... <laughs> wow! It's not any better with the adults. Okay, let's, um, let, let's, we're going to be really sanitized here. Because the, the first time I said this, I said, wait, they do that on a Sunday? <clears throat> let's say this is... <laughs> and, and, and granted, this is not the most common of examples. Um, but let's say that, that a, a husband and a wife are in the midst of divorce proceedings. There's number six for one. And in the midst of the back and forth, one alleges that the other has done something inappropriate in order to do to get a better settlement. So, yeah, that's, that's really, that's about as, as dull as possible, right? So you're, so you're in a courthouse, right? Who's in charge in the courthouse? The judge. What do you do when you go into the courthouse? I, wait, wait. I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so... Help me, God. So you are... A marriage is broken and being dishonored. A person is lying about the activity of another one. That's number eight. Uh, in order to gain what isn't necessarily theirs, which is number seven. Um, so we got six, seven, and eight. And the reason that you're doing that is probably because you, 9 and 10, are coveting something that isn't yours. And if you're taking from this person what isn't yours to take, that would help that person support his body and life, that's number 5. And if you're, if you're perjuring yourself in court, that's number 4 because you are not honoring the authority of the judge. And while you're doing that, you also are number two, taking the Lord's name in vain because you are swearing before God that you are not doing what you're actually doing, which leaves us with one and three. That's the question that comes up, and that's the wrong question. Because number one is obvious, because your God is no longer the one true God, your God has become me because I need and I want it now, like Veruca Salt there, which leaves us with number three. What is number three's explanation that we do not despise God's preaching or the Word? And when the Lord God says, love your neighbor as yourself, and you say, I don't care, I want that, you're despising God's Word by not loving your neighbor. So any commandment you break, I'll not be here all week. I've got like two minutes. So any commandment you break, if you can never break just one commandment, because whichever commandment you break, two through ten, it automatically assumes number one is broken because you've said, I don't care what you say, God. I know better. So who is now God? Me, not him. And when you do that, you automatically break number three because number three is to regard, not despise his word. So you, you almost can, can't break only two. There has to be three of them gone. And if the entire first table goes away, then there's no, dis no, there's no regard for the second. 
Now, that's not to say you kind of got to walk around all day going, oh, no, what did I do? Did I make God mad today? Did I despise His Word today? And that's a terrible way to go through life, isn't it? To be afraid. We should never, we should fear and love God, yes. And so we fear that fear Him in the sense that we know that He is the Almighty and Eternal Lord God, the Creator of the universe. But we also love Him because at the very same time, He has washed us in the blood of His Son Christ, washed us white as snow, made us His. And so when we do those dumb things on a Sunday, we can go to Him and say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he says, go in peace, my child. You are forgiven. Um, and I had to throw this one in because uh, it's, it's, just, it's one of those images you just can't not look at. You know, the seven deadly sins of social media, right? Tinder for lust. Gluttony on Yelp, right? Because you won't go to any place that doesn't have four stars on Yelp. And they have to have pictures of the garlic fries. Uh, <laughs> LinkedIn green, maybe, always, wanting, always looking for something better. Netflix, oh yeah, what do you know? Twitter, there it is. Wrath on Twitter. Envy on Facebook, what do you mean they're on vacation in you know, Aruba again? And then pride on Instagram. What is Instagram? You know, Instagram is nothing but, what, selfies and landscapes and all that kind of stuff, right? Unless it's, about, unless it's about higher things. We're, um, we're, we're, at, we're at the end, but what does God say about all these commandments? He says, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me. And keep my commandments. What does this mean? <coughs> we should fear his wrath. You know, it, it, the, the, just like, wait till your father gets home. We should remember that, that the Lord our God does have this power. But he promises, and there again is the but, but he promises grace and every blessing. Love and trust in him. The Lord our God loves you. And that's the first thing to remember. He's not there with the ruler. He's not there with the checklist saying, oh, that one's gone. Oop, now that one. Oop, messed up there. Boy, wait till the end of the day. This person's really in trouble. No. He's there in love. He always sees us with the eyes of love as his baptized children, showing love to a thousand generations. And so we respond to the love that he gives us, to the grace that he gives us, to the gifts that he gives us, by loving those around us. And when you mess it up, what does he do? You come before him in confession, and he absolves you. Even when you do something really, 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 really bad that causes you to be grounded and to lose the car and all social media privileges and everything, this is who he is for you. He loves you and wants to give you his good and gracious gifts. So next time on Plenaryville, my good friend, <clears throat> this, this was one of the winning one of the uh, winning costumes at the Reformation makeover for Here I Stand, um, and he also will sing you the song of his people if you are so inclined. Look, there was a time there was hair there, and we do also know that he is a colossal nerd. Fully invested in the Disney universe, right? And he may be angry, but he's never bitter. <laughs> Pastor Todd Peppercorn joins us tomorrow. Thank you.